Hello, I'm Nick Huzar, the host of Stuff TV. And uh, I started this channel because I found it really hard and complex to find answers about how my own existence impacts the planet. I uh, spent a bunch of time on that. I'm also the co-founder of OfferUp, so I've had a front row seat to our secondhand uh, kind of circular economy for over a decade now. And so I uh, decided to start this podcast to talk to really interesting thought leaders. And uh, I'm really excited to have Michelle Lee with us today from Clever Carbon. And why I think this topic is so important is because it was kind of the reason I even started this podcast, which was how does my existence impact the planet? And how do we actually quantify this? Because it's a very hard uh, thing to, to, to think about. Um, but Michelle, thank you for spending some time with me today and uh, maybe handing over to you. It'd be great to hear about your background and like, how did you get into starting Clever Carbon? Yeah, great to be here, Nick. Thank you for having me. My background is in tech sales, so not related to climate, not related to individual impact at all, but I was always just very aware of my own actions. And for me, sustainability is common sense, right? If we're drinking coffee and we're going out and we're always using disposable coffee cups, you know, if 7 billion people did that, it doesn't make sense to me. So the common sense thing is to bring a reusable cup. Same thing for a plastic bag. And as I grew on this journey, it also dawned on me that, you know, 7 billion people eating animal protein also doesn't seem sustainability or seem sustainable to me. And so early on in my journey, I uh, went vegan. Uh, I started vegetarian, did that for a month and then went vegan. And I started Clever Carbon because during my sustainability journey, I was living in London at the time and I lived by a park and every Monday I would go walk in the park and Saturdays and Sundays were busy days. And so everyone's at the park and they're bringing coffee and beer bottles and plastic containers for food. And then, so when I went for a walk on Monday, it was literally like this garbage dump. Mm. This beautiful park became garbage dump and the garbage cans were filled. And then there was like garbage all around the garbage cans. And I'm like, how can we be doing this? And I feel like there's always that number, you know, what gets measured gets changed. We know the number of steps we take a day. We know how much REM sleep we're getting. We know our running speed. We know how many calories we're eating. We know numbers that human brain operates really well with numbers. We don't even have to understand what it is. Like no one really knows what a calorie is, but we know numbers and we can compare it to each other. And so to me, when I saw this garbage, I was like, what is that number that can help people understand what their impact is? And I started learning about carbon footprint because of that. I was looking for that number, looking for information. And all the websites I went to were not consumer friendly. They were clearly not meant for people like me. It was very technical. But as I started to learn more, you know, I saw a carbon label for the first time. It's essentially like a nutrition label, but for a product. And it helps a consumer understand where the emissions from the product are coming from. And I started taking personal carbon footprint quizzes and then everything just sort of clicked. And I was like, I want people to know their impact and their carbon footprint. And I wanna do it in a way that is hip, fun, convenient, not doom and gloom. And that's how Clever Carbon came to be. Wow, that is kind of, you know, uh, there's a, a whole bunch to unpack there. I, I was curious on one of the things you said, which was you looked at a label that actually had kind of a car what company was doing that already yeah so there are a few companies that were doing it it's funny the label that i saw was a prototype it was like in a scientific paper it hadn't even been rolled out but there are many brands that carbon label today one that i want to highlight is a brand called panties it's p-a-n-t-y-s they're an apparel brand they're based in brazil and what i really like about what panties has done is every single product in their portfolio has a carbon label. They've done a life cycle assessment to understand where the carbon emissions are for the fibers, the materials, the sewing, the manufacturing, the packaging, the shipping, the use, and the end of life. So we call that cradle to grave, and that's really the gold mm -hmm. standard. And they share the emissions at each stage of the life cycle with the consumer. And what's interesting is that about 20% 
of the emissions actually come from the use. And that's because detergents have a high footprint and have a high impact on the planet. And Emily Ewell is the CEO, and she actually didn't know that until she did an LCA. So, you know, I really encourage brands and companies to do LCAs because what gets measured gets changed and you learn things you didn't know before. Yeah, I think that is my hope, I think, over the next you know, it's going to take some time to do this. But if I think of when I was a kid, all the packaging, I don't have any food here, but all the packaging and the food that you ate didn't have nearly the nutrition information that it had that as it does today. So I think part of the challenge here, it needs to be shared because manufacturing is typically made for like a large audience or a global audience. But the way you deal with waste and disposal is so regional and they, it's all very different. Like chances are where you live versus where I live is all very different. I think manufacturers need to have accountability in that entire supply chain from the beginning to end. It's not okay for Coke to, to produce how many, I don't know, they're probably one of the top water bottle manufacturers in the world and have no liability whatsoever of what happens with that. Yeah. And so my hope over time, and I think you're, you know, I think Clever Carbon can be a really helpful tool for that, is consumers start to ask for this and they start to drive change with their wallet. And they say, hey, I want to have something where I understand you know, its impact uh, beyond just the calories that I'm, that I'm eating. Um, what about, uh, so just stepping back a little bit more, how about at a macro level talking about kind of CO2 emissions? And I mean, it's a big number to talk about kind of how much we, we put out there, you know, annually. Why do you think this is such a hard kind of number to quantify? I mean, even if it was just start at a macro level. Yeah. So the studies that I have seen say that globally, we emit about 40 gigatons of CO2. Um, there are different numbers. So for example, Nick, you know, when we had a conversation, you mentioned 50. And with the CO2 equivalent, including methane and other gases, it could very well be 50. So methane is a greenhouse gas similar to carbon dioxide, but methane is um, 80 times more potent than CO2. And then there's nitrous oxide. And then there's all these other types of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent. There are greenhouse gases that are 16,000 times more potent than CO2. Um, thankfully, they make up a small amount of greenhouse yeah. gases emitted, but they're there. And I, and I know my understanding is CO2 is more abundant and, and it hangs out longer versus methane. Yeah, way more potent, but it's usually it's not it doesn't hang out in our atmosphere as long. Correct. The number that I've heard is around 10 years. And, you know, just kind of funny side note, there's a lot of talk about carbon offsets, but now people are starting to talk about methane offsets and methane credits as well. Um, so just kind of like a, a fun tip there. But yeah, you know, 40 gigatons of CO2. Most people have never had to encounter that uh, metric. I can't even comprehend what that looks like. That's right. like trying to comprehend like the size of space. It's I, my brain can't. It's too big. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's so big. And there's very few things in our lives that reach that type of scale. And, you know, we weren't always emitting 40 gigatons, but with the increase in population, the increase in consumption, the increase in the need for energy, whether it's just, you know, our digital, uh, our digital life, uh, you know, web three, all those different things. We use up a lot of energy and most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. So as the years went on, we, you know, added more and more to the atmosphere. And so currently we're at around 40 gigatons and we may grow this year as well. We're not at peak emissions yet. No, we're still going. Yeah, we we're haven't still... put a dent in the curve yet. No, the interesting thing is, so 40 gigatons, about 20 gigatons is naturally absorbed by our planet, by our land and our oceans. And then mm -hmm. the excess 20 gigatons goes into the atmosphere and it accumulates year over year, right? Year over year, we're producing 40 gigatons. Our planet is not developing new ways to absorb CO2. In fact, um, our oceans play a very important role in cycling and absorbing carbon, but our oceans are unproductive, which is why carbon removal is a really important piece of the equation and something that we need to invest in and really figure out how to scale quickly because we don't have a lot of time and we have a huge amount of mass of CO2 to move 
into uh, from the it's in the fast cycle now. We move it need to move it to a slow cycle where it's kept, it's stored, and it's sequestered, mm -hmm. and it's a tall ordeal. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of all of those things. We we need to do more things to just be more circular, be more efficient. That's going to take time. We need to sequester more CO two and and store that as well. Um, but I also think just, you know, we need to move faster back to the point of, you know, even while I'm spending time on a podcast like this, it's, I don't disagree that there are not really interesting things happening out there. I, my, my disagreement is the pace, right? We're just moving far too slow. And again, I hope, and this is why I think clever carbon is interesting. If you can personalize this and people understand it, then they can do something right. Then they can actually drive some change. Um, you know, one of the things I, I tell people often is. If you want to make an impact on our oceans or even on CO2, carry a reusable water bottle and carry a grocery bag. If everyone did that, you'd eliminate a quarter of the, the plastic waste that's floating around in our oceans. Um, and But I didn't know that. I didn't know that nine months ago until I went on this journey. And so that's part of what I'm hoping to share with conversations like this with people is there are things you can do. So let's talk about those things. And if people know that, then they can actually drive change. But I think that's a big challenge I've observed. It's just, it is very overwhelming when you think about the magnitude of all the things that are in your life and, and how they impact um, things. Um, and Nick, one yeah. more, just one more note on the macro level is that, you know, carbon literacy is what we do at Clever Carbon. We try to teach people about carbon footprint in a really hip and fun way. And I know we'll get more to that, especially on an individual level. But if we have people who are not carbon literate developing solutions, how do we know it's actually a good solution? We yeah. need to know the numbers. Like if you're saying you're a carbon offset, well, how much carbon are you removing? How fast can you scale? How much is it going to cost? These are all metrics that we need to know, but I don't see that enough today. When I talk to startups, when I talk to investors, you know, there's not a lot of carbon literate people out there and we're losing time and we need solutions that can scale in a short amount of time. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of hope out there. There's long ranging targets. And I know that from being in business long enough, it's very hard to have fidelity when you're going far out. I mean, especially 20 years out. So to say, oh, we've got a plan to get somewhere in 20 years. I don't buy it from any, any company. You, know, you need to actually, that's a, maybe a hope. And maybe you have a strategy, but now you have to start putting the mile markers down to show you're actually driving progress. And that's where I see a lot of, a lot of these conversations kind of falling short where people are just a lot of hope in that. Uh, so one of the things that stood out to me when we first connected was something that I think is near and dear to my heart when it comes to talking about these things is how do you make them easy for people to 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 play with? And I, I, I like your website. I can make you just it's something I could give to my kids and I go, oh, I actually get it uh, versus some of the other, I think, carbon calculators I've seen out there. It's like looking at my FICO score. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not exciting. So maybe talk a little bit about your website and I'll pull it up. Um, uh, for people to take a take a look at, but could you elaborate on kind of you know how you went about doing this? Yeah, I took a lot of carbon footprint quizzes. I probably did over twenty of them, and there were things that I liked, things that I think that could be improved, and I took everything and built our clever carbon quiz. And the quiz is a couple of questions. It's really short. It takes. We say two minutes, but really it takes under a minute to do. And there's really very few things that have a large impact on your carbon footprint, uh, your commute, you know, um, your diet, how much you fly, energy at your home. Is it uh, renewable and how much energy do you use? And actually one of the big determinants is what country you live in. And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, depending on your country, the average carbon footprint is really different. So I wanted to create a learning tool that wouldn't be doom and gloom, that would be fun, interactive, and personalized. So when you take the carbon footprint quiz, it's an interactive experience, but at the end, you also get a badge that has your name and your carbon footprint. And you can download that. You can share it to social media. It's got really fun branding. And the idea was that people will take the quiz and, and share that. So we wanted to just make it fun. And you don't have to download anything. You don't need to share your personal information. But, you know, Nick, there is no quiz out there that is 100% accurate. 
it's just it's just impossible you know you if you live in texas your carbon footprint in austin versus dallas versus houston is going to be different you have different impacts on the grid and that's going to impact your carbon footprint but also you know do people want to answer questions around you know how old is your hair dryer what type of condition is it um you know how many times in a year do you blow dry your hair before 7 a.m between 7 a.m and 9 a.m then repeat you know, rinse and repeat all those questions for- Oh yeah, you could just, go down the rabbit hole all day. You know, so I think the important thing is to know that you're getting approximation, you're creating a tool that helps people learn, A, you have a carbon footprint, B, what are the things in your life that have the largest impact, and three, how can you go from there to reduce it if you want to. We never assume at Clever Carbon that people want to reduce their carbon footprint, but we have resources there passively if they do. Yeah. And I think, you know, my wife and I often talk about this. She helps me with a lot of research and fact finding, and she's far better than I am at sleuthing the web. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the things that we think were interesting back to kind of just digging into data points is I, I think overall our clothing industry right, our, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world emits way more CO2 than fine airplanes around and cars and right? all of it. And then you just, you know, wow, that's, I think most people just don't think that. Like, I know I didn't until I, I got into this and yeah. It is a hard problem, but I think, like you said, just starting is, is important enough and looking at it and saying, hey, you know, if I take the clever carbon quiz, it's not about precision, but at least I have something that's going to enlighten me. And I think the hope from that is, oh, you know, what can I do about it? Right. Oh, there's a few things I can now go do, but um, it's really hard to kind of quantify and think through. So so when you when you created this quiz, is that was that kind of the approach then overall was, OK, I'm going to just focus on the big swaths and I'm just going to kind of cap it at this. Yes, exactly. And one of the really key questions that we ask in our quiz that not a lot of quizzes ask is, what country do you live in? So let me give you an example. The average carbon footprint of an individual in the U.S. is around 17 and a half tons annually. Uh, the footprint of someone in the U.K., 8.3. Someone in mm -hmm. Vietnam, 2.1. So if that same person from those different countries or the different person from the different countries were taking a quiz and they didn't answer what country they live in, they could potentially have the same carbon footprint, right? Mm. So one of the key questions that we incorporated that really helps kind of get closer to what the actual footprint is, is asking what country they're from. And we use data from the Global Carbon Atlas. They publish, um, you know, pretty recent data on almost every single country. And so that's the first question we ask is what country you live in, because yeah, it's so different depending on where you're from. Hmm. You know, one of, one of the things I was thinking about uh, as we started chatting, and my hope for um, a measurement like yours was the uh, credit score. So, you know, the credit score actually came out in the, I think it was the fifties, and then it was adopted by a pretty big bank at the time. Once they started using it, then a bunch of other people, a bunch of other banks adopted it. And so, you know, if you think about where you are today um, and where it could go, I mean, how do you think about driving more usage? Clearly, people can go to your website. By the way, it's clevercarbon.io and they could take the quiz there. Um, but there's got to be other ways to, to kind of get out there. Like, how are you thinking about that? I think partnerships are really key and corporates are really key. And there are kind of two different conversations, but let me give you an example of a partnership. Um, we have the absolute pleasure of working with the MBA Green and um, it's an extension of the MBA CARES team and they're the arm of MBA that does a lot of the social impact work. And for Earth Day, we did a branded Clever Carbon badge specifically for the MBA. And they showed a QR code during playoff games where, you know, people who are watching TV could scan that uh, QR code and find out their carbon footprint. And we got so much traffic to our website. And that's exactly yeah. you know, the people that we need to get the message out to is, you know, people who may not have contact with climate in their work or in their personal lives, but through their love of sport and having partners like the MBA who are lending their platform, 
incredible. Like we could really change the narrative on carbon literacy with a partnership like this. Yeah. So just finding more ways, you know, for exposure. I know, you know, at Offer Up, we've been talking about this for a while. I think you and I connected on this as well. Is how do we start to actually show this in our product? Because I think people care, but it's not always the first thing when they think about buying or selling something. So how do you put it, how do you start to weave it into products or into platforms like this that just become kind of second nature? And then how do you ideally become kind of the standard, like the credit score? It wasn't like we, it's not like we have 10 different credit scores in the US, we have one. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be great to have something like Clever Car Carbon being the thing that people start to adopt. But I, again, I acknowledge this is kind of a challenge getting it into to kind of into daily usage. And in fact, I find that's a kind of a bigger challenge with climate in general, too. Oh, this is really cool. It's small. OK, how do we kind of get it out there in the masses to start to adopt? And some of these things take time. Yeah. And, you know, on the corporates piece, Nick, when we graduate from school, you know, school's kind of where we learned a lot of our life skills and a lot of uh, the knowledge that we can apply to our jobs. But after school, like, where do we learn new things from? And I think our employers play this really key role that they may not even understand that impact. But if you think about mental health or DEI, where do we learn that from? We learn it from our employers, right? They embody it. They show us how can we do the right thing. You know, I remember sitting through DEI training and learning. Oh, okay, this is this is what it's about. This is how you know I can you know just be mindful. And climate is absolutely one of those pillars. But the great thing about these types of education at employers is that it creates fulfillment. It creates a sense of belonging. It creates opportunities for people to take on projects that are kind of outside their work. And there's not enough climate jobs for everyone to, to switch jobs. And I know so many people who want to work on climate, but I'm like, you know, you can actually do more at your company right now if you can speak up and say, hey, you know, I noticed we have plastic utensils in the kitchen. Like, can we replace that to, hey, can we get a 401k that has, uh, you know, healthier investments in them. And, you know, we need to create these vehicles of change. And, and, you know, our corporates play such a large role. And I think working and partnering with them and including climate education in the onboarding process is so powerful and also continued education throughout. So, you know, giving them access to a platform where they can take climate courses if they want to, or, you know, inviting people and, and speakers to, to speak to employees. Yeah, we, we just, it was an offer up um, for Earth Day, giving a presentation uh, a week before last. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because I was talking about exactly what you're saying. Like, how do you just educate folks? And one of the things that had come up was, you know, we still actually had in our office uh, some plastic water bottles. And I kind of called it out while, while I was up there. I'm like, what is this? Why is this here? Because we have, you know, water machines. So immediately I think they jumped on it and like, okay, I'm like, get these out of here. Um, the other thing, and I didn't know this, I had a feeling, but we have like these um, compostable plastic cups and the utensils are compostable. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, what, but again, you have to reinforce this and explain this to people. Cause if you look in the trash, they're throwing in the trash. So it's yeah. just a simply a matter of like, just put a sign up, put something up there so people understand. And there are a number of companies doing some really cool things around compostable waste and things like that. But I think that's part of the change in behavior is how do you create enough aware, awareness so people know, okay, this goes here and just kind of get into, into that new groove. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, and, and as you think about the future, so if you think about kind of where we are today, uh, what is your hope like in the next decade? Like, what are you, what are you hoping? You know, clearly there's a lot to tackle and you, we need to get everybody starting to think a little bit differently to drive change faster. But what is your hope around not just, you know, maybe clever carbon and, and just overall when you think of climate? My goal and then what I would love to see is just more data, more uh, metrics, instead of saying, you know, New York's going to go net zero. Um, how about, you know, we're going to get from, you know, whatever million tons to whatever million tons, like people don't know those numbers. So they're not using those numbers. And we're talking sort of soft metrics like net zero, which is a very vague concept for anyone at best. 
um, to actually just use numbers, um, whether it is carbon footprint, whether it is water footprint, whether it is waste footprint, and as a result, raising this awareness, like I want to be a consumer and be able to buy a product that I can see the entire life cycle of the product from a carbon emission standpoint. So a carbon label, I can see the water footprint, the waste footprint. I can understand how long was this product designed to last for? And if I need a repair, what can I do? And end of life, what is the best way to dispose of this product or bring certain parts back into uh, circularity? That's kind of my hope. Are there other things that you're hoping that people can you know, think through? Yes, I, there's a lot of things that are out of our control, but one thing that we can really control is our diet and emissions from agriculture and animal agriculture make almost 30% of global emissions, whereas, you know, commercial flying is two and a half percent from studies, um, not a license to fly, but collectively, if we make changes to our diet, we can really make an impact and you don't have to be perfect. Uh, you know, plant-based eating is very uh, impactful in a good way to the planet. The average vegetarian meal is about 600 grams of CO2 emissions. A serving of chicken is around 1,300. Serving of pork, 1,800. Serving of beef, 7,700. So as much as you can incorporate more plant-based items into your slowly, um, it's very, very impactful. And even, you know, your coffee, having dairy in your latte versus a plant-based milk in your latte can really make a difference. I only drink black coffee. The darker, the better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you for taking the time and uh, I'm happy to kind of get the word out. And, and like I said, I'm going to try to find ways to use this even at offer up and how we go about our business, but thanks for being here. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll probably try to add to the end of this video, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the NASA scientist that shows the year, year's worth of carbon floating around the planet via satellite. It's really cool visual. Maybe I'll tack it on the end of this video. It's like two minutes long, but it really shows you what is happening when you think about carbon emissions on our planet uh, on kind of an annual basis. But uh, thank you again for being here. Yeah, Appreciate the time. Fun. Thanks, Nick. Hi, this is Bill Putman. I'm a climate scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What you're looking at is a supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere. The visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas affected by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. In the Northern Hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over North America, Europe, and Asia. Notice how the gas doesn't stay in one place. The dispersion of carbon dioxide is controlled by the large-scale weather patterns within the global circulation. During spring and summer in the Northern Hemisphere, Plants absorb a substantial amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, thus removing some of the gas from the atmosphere. We see this change in the model as the red and purple colors start to fade. Meanwhile, in the southern hemisphere, we see the release of another pollutant, carbon monoxide. This is a gas that's both harmful to the environment and to humans. During the summer months, plumes of carbon monoxide stream from fires in Africa, South America, and Australia, contributing to high concentrations in the atmosphere. Notice how these emissions are also transported by winds to other parts of the world. As summer transitions to fall and plant photosynthesis decreases, carbon dioxide begins to accumulate in the atmosphere. Although this change is expected, 
we're seeing higher concentrations of carbon dioxide accumulate in the atmosphere each year. This is contributing to the long-term trend of rising global temperatures. The Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2, will be the first NASA satellite mission to provide a global view of carbon dioxide. OCO2 observations in atmospheric models like GEOS-5 will work closely together to better understand both human emissions and natural fluxes of carbon dioxide. This will help guide climate models toward more reliable predictions of future conditions across the globe.